everyone. Welcome to our investment webinar. So this is different from our regular biweekly educational webinars, right? We do that every two weeks uh, or Saturdays, 4 p.m. and no promotion, we just educate. And on this one, we're gonna basically be educating and also presenting you with an opportunity, okay? So I'm very happy to be sharing this presentation with everyone. We'll be discussing about a real asset tonight and it's going to be different from what family. So it's going to be oil and gas today and how oil and gas specifically can help you meet your financial objectives. Okay. So we do have King Corporation here. So they're our partner in this particular deal and they are a full service independent oil and gas operator and producing oil fields in Texas. And recently they've been doing Wyoming, Colorado, Oklahoma. And the King's business model specialized in strategically acquiring oil and gas projects, right? To further develop, divest and maximize the investor returns. And they have over 100 years of combined experience in oil and gas exploration and development, and they have a lot of staff of industry experts, professionals, which include geologists, petroleum engineers, field operators, land professionals, finance, accounting. And we have two of the professionals here today. And one is Eric Rice as their chief growth officer. We also have Brad Holden, is their senior vice president at King Operating based in Dallas, Texas. He's just here to just keep an eye on Eric mostly, but Eric is gonna be doing most of the talking. <laughs> but before we start though, I know some people are meeting us for the first time at Dr. B. Dizzy Capital. So I'm gonna just do a quick introduction to Dr. B. Dizzy Capital company. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Eric. Okay, so. Let me share the screen. Okay. Thank you very much. So the main goal for starting Dr. BTZ Capital, Dr. BTZ Finance, and everything we'd really do is to achieve, help other physicians, fellow physicians achieve financial freedom but with real assets investing. Okay. So we do other investing too, personally, right? We all try different things, right? Stocks, crypto and everything. And, but we do believe that real assets are the key to actually reaching the real financial freedom. And we also a real estate operator. We find deals for multifamily, self storages, and then we raise money for it and we run it and operate it. And then we also partner with best in class operators, right? King, Okay, and then so George here is Time Health Capital, also a syndication company. And then we partner with him to raise some of our funds. We have about $141 million under management currently. And this is like a little bit least of what we've been involved in. It would be nice if it's larger, but I'm going to just talk about it. As you can see, it's very, it varies a lot, but you can see how we start to scale a lot in the past one year. So we started eight units, 12 units, four units here, 28 units. And then we do some self storages, both storages. And in 2022, we partner with Majestic Investment Group, who is my mentor, Guarav. Many people know Guarav here and also King Operating. And then we did two funds actually. So one in like January and another fund towards the end of the year because people love, they love the W2 tax benefits from this. And after that, of course, we scaled into multifamily, 145 unit, 376 unit, 129 units. So that's just basically it. So the key really is to be involved in as much real asset as possible and also align your personal financial goal with the kind of investment you're doing. I find out, I was just talking earlier on today about the fact 
that I was, I have a lot of deduction, right? This year, like $1.2 million or so, and can only deduct 540 of it, 540,000. Why? W2 income. <laughs> so you're still limited somehow. So basically you need to start moving your income mostly away from your W2 and moving it into real assets. I'm doing it, but I need to do better. Anyway, so let me stop this year and then hand it over to Eric. Thank you, Doc. Let me get my screen sharing going here. All right. Are we good? Can you see me? Yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you folks for taking your time. I know Thursday at six o'clock or seven o'clock, wherever you are, is a difficult time. And if you're away from your family, I want to provide you as much possible information as I can. Uh, we are an, an independent operator here. We drill for American oil and American soil. So we're very much focused on the American energy problem that we find ourselves in right now, which is a self-inflicted wound. And of course, we have our disclosures and disclaimers. Make sure you review these at any time. We can send you PPMs if you're interested. Make sure you have all of your I's dotted, T's crossed. But I'm going to run through three basic categories of our offering right now, which is really moving along very well. So I'm going to run you through our strategy, how we select properties, what the difference between oil and gas and real estate investing is. I think this is a really big conversation right now. We're starting to see a lot of real estate people looking to oil and gas because we offer very similar models and very similar benefits. I'm going to walk you through the value and in the investment and then a little bit about our track record. So first and foremost, we are 200, we're raising $200 million into a tax advantage income producing asset backed limited partnership fund. This is a 506C for accredited investors only. You can certainly listen to the program, but we can only accept capital from an accredited investor. Uh, we are targeting a $1.34 billion exit from the collaboration of the multiple properties that we have in hand, which we have many. And I'm going to walk you through some of the similarities and some of the differences between real estate and oil and gas. So from a strategic standpoint, on the right-hand side, you'll find our business model, and it'll probably sound very familiar to you. We acquire properties, we develop the properties, and we divest the properties, very similar to multifamily and even some storage properties. We look for specific types of properties to invest capital into and develop with the sole purpose of increasing their value and selling them to someone else at a profit later on. From the investor standpoint, on the left-hand side, you'll find out that there's three real strong benefits to investing in oil and gas the way that we're structured. First and foremost is significantly reducing your tax liability, whether you are a 1099 independent operator or a W-2 income earner. It has the same benefits, just W-2 is limited to, like Doc was saying, $540,000 per year in deduction. At the same time, we offer monthly passive income. This is oil and gas, so it's not like real estate where you're going to get $600 a month. Some months it might be a couple thousand, some months it might be less. But the monthly passive income we have also comes with a pretty significant tax advantage. And then the thing that separates us from everyone else, you, you can talk to oil and gas operators throughout the country, and you'll find out that the first two benefits are offered by everyone. The third is only offered by us. We are, as far as we know, the only, only oil and gas operator that includes our leases, our true assets into our fund for our investors. For the existence of oil and gas investments, most of the money that oil and gas companies make is on the sale of the land, not necessarily the revenue from oil and gas. And we've decided as a firm that the direction we want to go is to create a true a democracy behind oil and gas investing. So not only do you get a tax break in monthly income from the sale of hydrocarbons, you also participate in the profits when we sell the land. So our business structure is pretty simple, but similar to real estate. So after doing significant geological research, we start to acquire leases, just like you would acquire land. And then we start raising capital, which is why we're on the Zoom today. As we raise capital, we don't wait for it to be completed. We actually start drilling immediately. So as we drill wells and they start producing oil or gas, these are called PDP, proven, developed, and producing wells. These are revenue generating properties. Every time we produce revenue from these PDP wells, we increase the value of the lease, the value of the land. While we're drilling for revenue, we also create what are called PUDs or proven undeveloped locations. Essentially for every well we drill, we prepare the surface. A PUD is a location where we know there's hydrocarbons underneath the ground, but what we're doing is preparing the surface for future drilling either for ourselves or for another entity who comes along and wants to buy our properties. As our property increases to generally double what we raise, so in this scenario, we're raising $200 million. As we get to around a $400 million property value, 
we begin to essentially shop the properties in the open market. That is really our model. We want to be able to get our principal back in hand from our investors as soon as possible, which isn't as easy as it sounds, especially in turbulent markets, but that truly is our goal. So it's important, especially as real estate investors, to understand how we select properties and why. And this is a really good outline of our acquisition methodology. First and foremost, when we open up a fund, we're always focused on multiple BOFs or basins of focus. We do this for a couple of reasons. Number one, to optimize the upside. If we strike oil in all three of those in a really positive manner, it's going to be great. Also to minimize risk. In most oil and gas funds, the, they raise a small amount of money to drill a small amount of wells. And if you have one that doesn't hit, generally everyone loses. So we're not only trying to optimize the upside for you, we're also trying to minimize the downside. Now, in these three to five basins of focus, we're always looking for underdeveloped probable acreage that's near proven production. In oil and gas, we use very scientific terms like closeology. So we want to find pieces of land that are very close to high producing wells. We're looking for attractive pay zone geology. What a pay zone is, is very simple to understand. Imagine a plate with a stack of pancakes turned upside down. That's what the surface of the earth looks like. And each layer of rock underneath that is a different zone. When those zones have hydrocarbons in them, that's our ability to get paid. So we call them pay zones. So we're always looking for multiple pay zones, generally two to six. You'll find out that there are some places that have seven pay zones, but we're also looking for 3D seismic, which is a technology, kind of like a, an overarching X-ray of the land to let us know where things are below the surface. We're always targeting 20 drilling locations. So we're always looking for multiple drilling locations on every plot of land in very friendly environments. We don't want to be beholden to the federal government and their whims for green energy. So we have very low exposure to federal land. So we're looking for places in Texas and Oklahoma and Wyoming and Louisiana, constantly shopping around for these areas because they're, the regulatory environments are much more friendly than a California or Colorado, which we do have a property in. But some of these places are very difficult because of the un, un, log, illogical war on fossil fuels. But we're always looking for privately owned and state-owned acreage that also keeps us free from federal regulation. And the way that we structure our leases is very unique. So we do what's called held by production leases. It allows us to put very little down to acquire access to the land and their mineral rights. But as soon as we start producing, it extends the lease in perpetuity. So as long as we're producing oil and gas for the landowner, that lease is ours. There's no threat of losing it. Now, if possible, we look for PDP or proven developed producing revenue generating wells to acquire. In this market, it's pretty difficult, although we just did through a merger. But we're generally looking for a 50-50 split between oil and gas. I will break one myth for you. There is no, no mystery behind where oil and gas is. Technology has really solved that problem. We know where all the oil and gas in the world is. It's just a matter of can we navigate the pay zones below the surface of the earth to extract it. So we're looking for areas that have both natural gas and oil because they have their own specific independent economies of scale to feed. And we generally want to keep our geography intact. So we don't want to look for operations that are far outside areas where we already have teams and equipment and machinery. So we try to keep everything close as we can to existing operations. So this is a good progress report of our development methodology. We generally try to map out our first three wells. Our target was July to drill our first three wells. At the end of July, we'd actually drilled five in this fund. So we're ahead of schedule in that area. We acquired our third piece of property, which is actually our last fund through a merger on June 1st. So we're a little bit on schedule with that as well. We're about three days late of our target, but that's okay. And then we look for MPI distribution, which is monthly passive income or what a lot of people like to call mailbox money to begin here in August, which it's going to, and it will increase in September. Now, as we go through this process, and remember, we, we do geology to determine whether the land is good. We acquire the leases. We raise capital. As we raise capital, we're drilling for oil. So we create PDP, proven developed producing wells that generate revenue. And then while we're doing that, we're preparing the surface. So it's important to understand PUDs, the proven undeveloped wells. As you drill one, imagine building an apartment complex on a piece of raw land. What we do every time we drill a well is essentially that. We create a revenue generating property. But right next to it in certain locations, we'll actually prepare the surface for future drilling, like pouring a foundation without completing the building so that we have the option of either drilling there again or selling it to someone at a premium because a lot of the hard work to prepare for drilling has been done. 
Now, again, once we get past that area and we have double what we've raised on valuation, we look for two different types of divestitures. The first one, we look for an income need. So a family office, a pension, some sort of organization that has investors that need income. We will go to them and sell them part of the fund, but not the assets. So if we raised $400 million, we would want to sell 40 or 50% of the fund to a, an income buyer to return capital back to our investors while they still have investment producing income for them and a big tax write-off. And then, of course, as the property matures and revenue increases and value increases, our ultimate asset sale would go to a much larger oil and gas company. They look for big pockets of land that have proven production, that, are, that have a full due diligence file done on all the geology of every square acre that we own. So there's a lot of work that goes into prepping a piece of land for a sale at a premium. Now, this is a good outline of our portfolio, where our focus is right now. So I will say our focus, because there are eight other properties not listed on here. We're in the process of selling them as we speak, which is a great time for you as an investor, because that's more revenue that we share with our investors. But when we merged, we found a bunch of properties that didn't fit our model moving forward. So we are actively shopping them in the open market. But the four that we are focusing on, beginning in Wyoming, this is actually two separate pieces of property that we combined. So we now have in the Bighorn Basin, almost 53,000 contiguous acres of fertile land. This is important because big buyers like Shell and Exxon, they're looking for property that's in a great area with generally 10,000 or 20,000 contiguous acres for them to continue to drill on. We have a very large piece of land in Wyoming, which is also really oil and gas friendly from a regulatory environment. That's got a good split, about 50-50 natural gas and petroleum. We've already proven out four pay zones up there. We're working on a fifth pay zone as we speak. We anticipate being able to sell that piece of land for 100 to $300 million in the next three to five years. The big risk up there is not necessarily the terrain. Below the surface, it's the surface. So where we are in northern Wyoming, we only have an opportunity to drill maybe seven, sometimes eight months out of the year, depending on snow. Last year, we closed down drilling. The day we closed down drilling up there for seasonal risk, it was negative 68 degrees with the wind chill. And as soon as all the snow melts, then you go through another season of about a month of a foot and a half of mud. So it's difficult to get trucks in and out and teams in and out. So our risk up there is just seasonal drilling. That's a great piece of property. And we also have Colorado, which is an interesting story because we acquired this piece of land in Larimer County a few years ago with a past fund. Immediately after acquiring it, starting to file for our permits to drill, that county switched from red to blue politically. And it became increasingly difficult to get permits from the environmentalists that had basically taken over the local government. We were getting ready to walk from that property. We decided to include it in our next fund and grandfather our investors into the next fund as well. And since then, we've had some success. But what has happened in that area is that the surrounding three municipalities and counties, they've actually run out of commercial and drinking water. There's a huge drought occurring in Colorado. So we're in the middle of structuring a contract that will allow us to drill for oil and gas but it'll also allow us to earn anywhere between 20 and $60 million selling our water. When you drill oil for oil and gas, you get a tremendous amount of water, which is normally a really big expense to us. In, our, in one of our Texas properties, we're getting ready to spend about $700,000 to dispose of the water. Whereas in Colorado, we actually for $5 million can build a water treatment plant and turn that normal expense into a pretty large profit center. So we are expecting 20 to 60 million from that piece of land. The sensitive community risk is what we call it up there. It's just a matter of getting through the environmental folks to be able to drill for oil and gas, which the byproduct is water. It's funny, when, when the environmentalists need water, they're more willing to give away drilling permits. So things are moving along pretty well there right now. Our Cotton Valley project right now, we have two fully drilled horizontal gas wells in, in, in Cotton Valley in East Texas. It's a small piece of property, 2,000 contiguous acres. We're debating right now whether to sell it or keep it. What has happened to us since then, when we drilled these wells, they cost more. Last year, the drill cost of drilling went up 35% at the end of the year. And at the same time, the price of oil went down 60% and the price of gas went down 80%. So we're waiting for the economics to come back in the natural gas space. So we're literally sitting on fully drilled wells that just simply need a frack and a completion. It's about a 30-day turn time. We expect those wells to produce anywhere between $7 and $15 million in free cash flow with a possibility of divestiture, though these small pieces of property are really useful to other small operators and probably won't be a tremendous amount on the exit from that. 
And our risk there is natural gas pricing. That's really it. Uh, these are already drilled. They just need to be completed. Now, the Borden County, Texas, the Believers Project, this is the unicorn. This is truly a very unique property in oil and gas. When we started this property, it was about, we had about 4,000 acres. And when we started drilling our wells and looking at our logs and the geology coming out of the ground, the numbers were blowing away our geologist who's been doing oil and gas for about 40 years. And the numbers were just fantastic. So we noticed right next to us, the closest well to us is, a, is about a 1,200 barrel a day producing. That's a huge well in our industry. And they started knocking on the door of our ranch owner, trying to acquire our land. So we've already gone through a land war here and expanded our footprint to 21,460 contiguous acres. Uh, this is a very heavy oil focus, which is great timing for us because the price of oil is moving up pretty rapidly. We've already proven out six pay zones in this area, which is just truly unheard of. We're identifying a seventh pay zone with our fifth right now. The real unique facets of this are the fact that this piece of property has one landowner and one mineral right owner. That is so hard to find in oil and gas. I cannot express to you how difficult it is to find any land that has any hydrocarbons with one land and one mineral owner. Truly a unicorn in the space to have 20,000 plus contiguous acres in the Permian Basin. We're just outside of infrastructure. We're on the Eastern Shelf. There's about seven miles of pipeline that would need to be run, which we'll pay for as soon as we start getting more oil out of the ground, which we just started this past month. But we'll extend that infrastructure out there. Everything that we do that I'm talking about increases the value of the property. We are expecting a 400 million to a $1 billion exit from that piece of land by itself. It is truly an operation that we are really geared and focused towards right now, but I can't express to you enough how rare it is to find that type of property in today's market in oil and gas. So we've been very fortunate to, to have the opportunity to build it out. These are just simply maps. People like to see maps. Everything we do is completely verified and can be researched at any time on the Railroad Commission. But this is the plot of land in Borden County to the left and in, in the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming. This is a really good slide. I try not to run through it. I've gone through most of it already. It's just a reiteration. On the Believers Project, we planned on drilling three wells by the end of June. We've actually drilled five to date. We're completing two of them as we speak. One of them is doing really well. I don't want to talk about the numbers yet on it, but we'd usually give it a week to see what's going to come out of it. But the numbers are looking great out of our third well there. We are planning on drilling another six before the end of the year on that Borden County property. That depends on capital raising, of course. But our plan is to drill and complete at least six of these, if not nine, by the end of the year uh, and get prepared for Q1 of 2024. In Wyoming, we've, uh, we've already planned out our next eight locations. We got that done on time in Q2. Right now, we're preparing to drill two of our wells. We will be drilling the first horizontal well in this basin ever. So this could be a really good thing for us. And as Q4 comes about and the snow starts to fall, between Q1 and mid Q4 and mid Q1, it's really just a planning phase in Wyoming. In eastern Texas, the Cotton Valley, again, it's market pricing. As soon as natural gas prices start to rise again, which they're starting to currently, all we have to do is put out a request for proposal, get pricing on fracking, and we're pretty much good to go in 30 days. And again, the water project is right now we're dealing with counties and municipalities to structure revenue contracts with them. We anticipate having that done by the end of Q4 or Q3 so that in Q4 we can start drilling and selling the water. Value, super important. I can talk about the things we do all day, but as an investor, it's important to see what you get from this. I am here. I actually come from the public markets. I come from quantum biology. I'm not a lifelong oil and gas guy. This business is fascinating to me. I got into it because this country needs oil and gas to be independent and survive. And as an executive, Eric, yeah, I'm going to just interrupt for just a minute because I feel like we should complete this question before we move on to the next stage. Sure. I wanted to add first that I'm invested with King Operating and we didn't only just do the fund with them. We actually did invest with them. We had a very great return last year. And of course, the price of gas and oil went down. So the distribution went down, but still, if you average it, still better than real estate so far. And then I, we got 90% tax benefit from it. So that's how I got my like 1.2 mil. 
if we can, Doc, let me go. The presentation is going to answer 80% of your questions if we just get through it. It's designed that way. We map this out knowing the questions that we normally get. So let's run through these and I'll do a Q&A at the end and just let it flow and we'll get done with it and get everybody back to dinner and their kids quickly. Okay. Okay. This one was related to the drill wells. It's yeah. asking about, can you share the production details of the five drill wells? Yeah, so our first well is what's called a test. So in general, you drill your first well on a piece of property to get information about the surface below. We are producing 20% oil, 80% water. We've been running water out of it for about six weeks. We're getting ready to plug it and go up what we call up hole. So we're going from one lower pay zone to a higher pay zone to produce oil. In general, you don't get any oil out of a test. You're just seeing what's in there. Number two that we drilled is right by it, 60 feet away. It's in one of our puds. That well has been free-flowing 120 barrels a day for about 46 days now without a pump. So natural formation pressure has been pushing oil to the surface, 88 feet to the surface to our bins on its own. So Mother Earth is doing all the pressure work. That is also a unicorn. And not many people back here, we have bets going when the free flow stops. So when you get a piece of property where the well is flowing without any sort of mechanical assistance from a pump, you wait until the pressure goes down and then install the pump. We haven't seen any break in performance of this in about 46 days. So right now we're doing about 118 barrels a day out of that. Uh, our third well is a big horizontal. It's 84, 83 or 8,400 feet deep and about 7,500 feet across. So it's almost 16,000 feet of drilling. We just, uh, we just swabbed and perfed this last week. So we started getting oil from it on Monday. And right now, I, I don't want to put the numbers out. Usually give everything a week until you project it, but we're getting well over 200 barrels a day out of that right now with no assistance. So as we install our ESP, our electric pump, we'll start to get more information out of that. But it's been a pretty good yield thus far, and we'll see what technology can do to increase it. Vertical number four, which is a vertical well, that has been drilled uncompleted. So we are in the completion process right now of going through PERF and we'll probably have to frack that one a little bit, but we're just completing that. Number five is another big horizontal and we are just now getting done with drilling. So we have information on wells one, two, and three, four and five are simply holes that have been drilled and we're now working on the completion process. Okay. Good question. By the way, as an investor, we go through all this stuff. I send out a video every Saturday. We started this last week where it's called the well report. So as an investor, every Friday, I get into our little podcast studio, give you an update on the wells and where they are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we have a lot of wells. We have 120 producing wells in the fund, and we'll let you know when they're doing great. We'll also let you know, like a couple of them have to be plugged for compliance purposes for a week, and that will affect your income and the profit of the fund. But we'll certainly let you know that stuff every Friday. Okay. Something is blocking the sharing of the screen on the right. I'm not sure it's on your side. We see the 3.5X, but we didn't see what's next after that. That might be the view. That might be, you. It, all, all you want to do is take a slide of video feeds from people and move it over to the left. It's blocking mine too, but you can move it. It's pretty easy, just drop and drag it. But let me walk into this so we know what it is. Okay. So the three main benefits for you as an investor, first and foremost, oil and gas is a difficult job. We certainly, like Doc was saying, we're, we'll talk about the upside and talk about the downside. Oil and gas is difficult. We are literally going where no man has gone before. We are drilling miles below the surface of the earth in very difficult terrain, so to speak, stuff that we're familiar with. Generally, right off the bat with oil and gas investing, I am an investor in all of our funds, by the way, personally. You get 100% tax write-off for the investment. You don't have to do anything extra. You don't have to become a real estate property manager or any sort of professional. It's just granted the way that the IRS code is written. So 100% tax write-off in general saves our average investor for the $200,000 investment, about $60,000 day one. So the tax benefit definitely de-risks and gives you good comfort through the first few months as we drill. We are anticipating that the monthly passive income for the fund will end up being around 8 to 12% through the rest of the year. So on a $200,000 investment, that's $1,300 to $2,000 in free cash flow. By the way, it's big tax advantages in oil and gas until the fund is profitable. These are not taxable distributions. So they're fantastic to be able to just tuck away and save. And the end game, the ultimate goal for us is to be able to sell the property for three and a half times what we paid for it as a fund. 
So right now our Borden County property in Texas, we have, we probably, we could probably sell that, that one particular property for four times what we paid for the leases. And I saw a question on the leases as well. So our leases are held by production. So almost nobody in oil and gas owns the land that they drill on. And I say almost because there's probably 5% of all oil fields are drilled by the owner. In general, these are big ranches that you're drilling on, big pieces of land. When you sign a lease, you generally get three years to produce on the lease. You make payments like a normal rental property. But as you produce, as you drill a well and you're producing oil, as long as we're producing oil on our leases, those are our pieces of land in perpetuity, which adds a tremendous amount of value when you sell the leases in the open market. But the goal here is to get to that three and a half X. That is our target. That could be higher, it could be lower, but it's certainly what we're working towards as a fund. So let me explain the tax benefit and how it works a little bit. So on a $200,000 investment, which is our single unit price, for the last 15 years, we've produced a 75% deduction in year one. So the way that these work is that when you invest $200,000, you get a big write-off in year one, and the rest of it is spaced out over a four-year period. So you don't just get the benefit year one, you get smaller benefits moving forward. So what this means for you is that if you put in $200,000, uh, by the way, last year, our two funds produced a 90% write-off and an 87% write-off. We've done 75 consistently for 15 years. Some of our competitors out there promote an 85% write-off for year one, and they produce a 40% write-off for year one. I would much rather commit to a 75% write-off and get a higher return for you, but that all is dependent upon how we spend the capital. That's how we get the write-off. So on a $200,000 investment, you'd be able to remove $150,000 from your adjusted gross income, your taxable income, whether it's W-2, 1099, from a business, passive or active, comes off your adjusted gross income. And that income will reduce not only your federal, but your state tax burden. So most of our clientele, if they live outside of California or New York, are right around a 40% tax margin between state and federal. So a $200,000 investment essentially keeps you from having to pay $60,000 to the IRS while you have your money at work. So the way that we actually run these deals is important to understand. So as we pull oil and gas out of the ground, the first people who get paid are the mineral rights owners and the landowners, the people who leased us the ability to create revenue. After that, it's the operator. It's the team that pulled it out of the ground. They get paid once oil is actually paid for in the open market. That leaves us with net, net profits. Out of the net profits, which is what King Operating would get, 80% of our net profits are distributed back in the hands of our capital partners every month. We have monthly distribution until your principal is returned. So if you invested 100,000, after you got 100,000 back, our splits would go to 60-40. We make a bulk of our money on these types of deals selling the property, not necessarily on the production of oil and gas. We distribute a lot of that, just like a REIT, a real estate investment trust would. We make our money by leveraging our capital to develop the land so that we can sell it for a premium in the open market. So after you've gotten your principal back in hand as a capital partner, 60% of the gross proceeds or the net proceeds of the sale of the land go into your hands, 40% goes to King. These types of deals are, I know most people are new to oil and gas. Oil and gas is very similar to real estate, except instead of dealing with tenants and toilets, you're dealing with oil and gas. Very similar in the way they work. Every month, we see 30 to 50 divestitures like this in the open market. Just like we saw in October, we see them every, I need to update the slide, but we see these every month where someone will come in and buy 30 or 40% of an operation to basically acquire the revenue for the next 10 years. And they'll pay premiums of 200, $300 million for it. That's for that mini divestiture that we were talking about earlier to an income need. The exits are a lot more common. And in a market like this, where the bond market, if you're in bonds, by the way, it's not financial advice, but I would get out of them quickly. We are approaching a triage moment in bonds. People will be looking for alternative income in the future and oil and gas fits that void. But in the actual sale of the assets, but we'll of course be selling to an Exxon, a Chevron, one of the larger companies out there, or one of the mid-sized companies. The way that oil and gas works for field development is, Companies like us go out and take the raw land, build it up to a certain scale, sell it to another company who either finishes the project or builds it to another level and sells it to the bigger guys who want the existing production. Large companies aren't big drillers. They acquire existing production that small companies like us have created. And we see transactions like this left and right all the time. But we are approaching 
a real strong mergers and acquisitions season in oil and gas. As you're starting to see in the real world, price of gasoline is going up, price of oil is going up. They've essentially suppressed the price of oil for the last year by selling out our strategic petroleum reserve to, for political gain, to be quite frank with you. And those days are almost over. So we are about to see a big jump in the prices of these commodities. And you're going to see a big jump in mergers and acquisitions coming up very soon, primarily from private equity groups who acquire the land and then hire an operator to farm it. So we've created for our real estate investors a sensitivity analysis. I'm not going to run through this with you. If you're interested, certainly reach out to Doc. He'll get you in touch with Brad and he can run you through the sensitivity analysis. The one I'm showing you right now is our P10 case. This is our management case. This is what we're shooting for. This is our optimal return is to get to about 12 and a half thousand barrels of oil a day as an equivalent, that's oil and gas, and to be able to produce that three and a half X return. And that would require an $85 a barrel price for oil and about $5 for gas. These next few slides are just a sensitivity analysis. Where would the fund be valued at? With this type with X production, X market pricing, you can certainly run through these on your own. I advise you to do so. You get a good feeling of the spread, the difference, how pricing can affect, how production can affect your investment. These are certainly things that we look at every day. Uh, we have everything down to a P90 case, which is in our scenario, what we believe to be the worst case scenario, which you'll see here with a one and a half X return based on 6,700 barrels, $60 a barrel. That's our bottom case scenario. I personally can't see, and I do a lot of our macroeconomic overview. I cannot personally see oil touching $60 a barrel for the next five years. The market is just really primed with modern energy consumption. And I think we're starting to get through the myth that wind and solar could ever replace natural gas and petroleum. So a little bit about our track record and our history. Where'd it go? Nope. I'm missing this slide. I'll do it verbally. So our track record, we did a fund like this in 2015 as when we began. Like I said before, your average oil and gas company essentially will take in your capital, give you a good tax benefit for the investment, and then pay you out every month or every quarter on the sale of oil and gas. That's really where the party stops. Um, and, the, and these are generally 2015 to 25 year funds. And at which time the property that you financed is going to be sold three or four times for tens of millions of dollars in profit. So when we flip the model to give the investor access to the leaseholds, we, we did our first beta run, our first alpha beta, whatever you want to call it. We raised four and a half million dollars. We sold it for 13 and a half million dollars in 19 months. And then we got into Larimer County, Colorado, which I explained to you earlier. We saw the political environment completely flip on its head. And then we went through a pandemic where the price of oil essentially went to zero for a small period of time. That project was dead at that moment, but we grandfathered it into our program three. Program three, if you were an investor from January 1st to December 19th, you had a 19% return last year, which is phenomenal. The bulk of our capital came in August. And in August, the cost of drilling was starting to rise. By the end of the year, it had risen 35%. And in August, oil was at about 120 a barrel and gas was about $9 a unit. By the time the year ended, oil was down in the 70s and natural gas was around 225 per MCF. At the same time, the cost of drilling was up 35% across the board. So we had a great overall year, but we ran into a difficult nine month stretch where it cost us 35% more to earn 80% less selling the product. So what we did, instead of looking for a new third property for this program, what we did was we merged the two funds together. It allowed us to save about $20 million in new lease costs and be able to put them into development and drilling more oil for more profit. And now we have these funds merged together with the Borden County property, which to be honest with you, I've never been more excited about. I think it's great that both programs are together because those in program three would really love to have the Borden County properties. And the merger was confusing to people. And the honest answer is, we had to pay more to earn less, and that's not economically viable. In one fund, the other fund, we needed new property. We didn't want to deploy any capital for it, so we had a chance to do a cashless merger, acquire new land that we know better than anybody else on planet Earth. We've been working it for two and a half years, and now we have ourselves a very good infrastructure and model. So that is pretty much the horse, and here are your jockeys. So Jay Young is our CEO and founder. He runs the show here. Jay has, has been an oil man since he was nine years old. So he's been working on rigs with his grandfather literally since he was a child. This is an industry he knows inside and out. Peter Snell is our president. Peter comes from the normal business world like I do, but we're here to create some 
some uniformity and some new processes and procedures and really bolster the ability to have a good investor relations operation within the fund. Graham Patterson just took over for Rex Gifford as CFO. He comes from the investment banking background. He's been really a tremendous benefit to the company, allowing us to, to convert our books from an oil and gas company into an acquirable oil and gas company, which is a big chore. Chandler Knox is still on here. He actually, we actually parted ways with Chandler, and we now have a new CEO, Kelly Duncan, in here, head of drilling operations. Paul Jerome, our EVP of geoscience, has drilled between he and Kelly, who we just brought in. They have drilled 1,800 wells together in their lifetimes. Paul has been involved in a, at least 4,000 drills between the United States and the Middle East. John Malden, who many of you as investors may know, runs Thoughts from the Frontline. He's been a well-known author and global economist. He joined our team about seven months ago. Nathan Myers is our in-house legal officer. Nathan, is, he's been night and day in this operation since I've been here. We are one of the few independent oil and gas companies that actually has any form of inside counsel. And Nathan is actually one of the 300 board-certified oil and gas attorneys in the state of Texas. So having him here is just amazing. He saw what we were doing. He actually closed down his private practice and he, got, he was working with us full time. Michael Tanner is our director of finance and analytics. So he is in charge of making sure that not only we drill efficient wells, but they're economic. Rex Gifford was our CFO for about 15 years. Started out in the IRS as a field agent in oil and gas. And again, he's been a CFO for 30 years, half of that time with King operating in oil and gas. But Rex, we moved him into a position where he's working with really on the tax side. So he helps us put together our fund structure. He's a master at doing this. Rex is truly a wealth of information in oil and gas, but he works with your accountants. It just got over, as we grew, it became overbearing to have him be CFO when he is literally the best person for your accountant to contact when tax time comes. So Rex work, works with us on the investor relations, product development, and taxation. Garrett Stacy is a second generation petroleum engineer, and he is in charge of completion and product optimization really brilliant guy. Having him here has been, again, a night and day experience. To give you a little understanding of this slide, when I started here, there were three people on the slide. I started here last May. When I began at King, we had we were coming out of COVID like everyone else, and our industry got really pummeled during COVID, by the way. We survived. Many didn't. But we went from 10 people in our corporate office to today we have 53. So a year ago, we really didn't even have the manpower to execute what we were doing. We had to outsource quite a bit. And now we are in-house on about 95% of our operations and procedures. So you're not working with a company that's shrinking. You're working with one that's growing and really focused in on transparency and communication with our investor base. So it is important to look at Paul Jerome. Is, he is the final authority in new properties and new drilling locations and everything geology here. And he has said, I've never seen this many potential pay zones in a certain location. I'm telling you, the Borden County property we have in oil and gas is truly a unicorn in the space. So if you're interested, go ahead and reach out to Doc. He'll get you in touch with Brad. It's a pretty simple process from here. You determine how much you want to invest. We look at it from a tax perspective, income perspective. You review some documents that we send to you, our PM and subscription agreement. You execute it, send a wire. You're plugged into the system. We'll be communicating with you every weekend to let you know how the wells are going. We do a weekly newsletter and a monthly newsletter with a full well report. And every month when you get your distributions, we send you a complete breakdown of all of our wells. So you get a 63-page attachment to your email that shows you here's how much was paid out, here's where the expenses went, and here's the profitability of each. We're extremely transparent in the space and very proud of that fact. You know, when things don't go well, that's not so fun, but it's always something that we do here because transparency is literally our first value in our corporate values. So let's open it up for questions and answers and see what we can do to raise everybody's understanding here. Okay, thanks, Eric. Great presentation. Thank you. And I know I listened to it multiple times, but you keep adding more <laughs> presentations to it. So. I try not to be boring, Doc. <laughs> it's good. The One of the first ones says, what's the olden period for 200K? Um, that depends. So we, we've targeted the fund. It's a five-year hold, a three to five-year hold, but... I think that these properties will actually move quicker. The world is really starting to understand how important oil and gas is. We account for 84% of the world's energy. After two decades and $10 trillion invested in wind and solar, it's actually reduced oil and gas by only 2%. So you're starting to see a lot of catch-up capital in the space, and you're starting to see a lot of people seeking more sources of energy. So we anticipate a big M&A market coming in 24 and 25. So it could be as like our first fund was a five-year fund, but we sold it for a 3x profit in 19 months. 
So I'd like to tell you the long side is five years. That could be six if things go wrong. The long side's five years, the short side's 19 months, and the average is somewhere around that three and a half year mark. Just depends on market conditions and where we are with the drilling program. And someone said, can we have the copy of these slides for further review? I of do course. know that we're going to have the recording, but do you, can you send us this slide too? Of course. Yeah. Just reach out to doc, reach out to Brad through doc and we'll get you anything that you need. We'll send you out a link for it. No problem. Okay. Perfect. So let's go down. So when the lease is sold, does the profit come to the investors? I've answered that, but I want to hear it from you. Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 60% of the sale of the leases is distributed back to investors. That is truly our differentiator in the marketplace is that you actually own those leases with us. In most oil and gas deals, you don't. So yes. And it's not all at the end either. We had a divestiture in October of last year, a small one of about $800,000. We sold that lease. 100% of the $800,000 went to the investors, not to the company. Okay. And one question from one of my partners says, can you explain the merger again? In sure. The fund itself was going fantastic until the price of drilling, the cost of drilling went up 35%. So when you drill like a horizontal, imagine your business model, if you planned on spending $10 million to drill a well, and all of a sudden it costs 13.5 million. And at the same time, the price of oil and gas went from 120 and $9 respectively down to 75 and two. So essentially we were paying 35% more to earn roughly 80% less. That put us in a very difficult financial situation along with all the credit crunching that's been happening. You, most of you are in real estate, so you understand better than anyone how interest rates are affecting your returns. In that time frame, we had a $50 million line of credit that got closed. Uh, there's been a big push in the banking system to, to restrict credit, especially into our industry. So we were in a pretty tough spot. So we actually did a cashless merger to bring all of the assets from program three into program four and make it an, an equal split between the two. It wasn't ideal. It wasn't something we intended from the beginning. But while program four was searching for a third property, we had an opportunity to basically acquire program three with assets that we already have all due diligence done on all the geology, existing production, existing revenue, and we already knew our next drilling locations. So that's a brief summary of the merger itself. It wasn't a huge thing. It was just essentially combining two assets and reducing costs and increasing profitability. Judge, am I at you? <laughs> Are you satisfied with the answer? Yeah, that helps. It just, it still sounds like you're injecting capital into the underperforming one. Is that correct? You could look at it that way. Certainly that's the way generally an investor looks at it until you realize that an asset is an asset. So acquiring a third asset would have cost us $20 million. The leasehold in Borden County is about 23 million so far. So what we did was instead of deploying 20 million into new land, we actually put 20 million into production on existing land. So in essence, yes, that fund was in financial trouble. Honestly, to no fault of our own, we'll certainly take accountability for it. But when you have those types of market conditions, we were getting ready to sell off some of the properties, which is what we'd normally do. That's the beauty of an asset backed oil and gas fund is that the chance of losing it all is next to none because there's always an asset to sell to recoup. But it's difficult to sell properties for a premium when the prices are that low. So when we looked at the market conditions, the economic conditions and the financial status of program three, the logical thing was to hold. You know, you want to hold on to those properties until the prices go back up because the value shoots up. So what we did was instead of deploying 20 million into a piece of land that we'd have to start all over again, we were deploying that 20 million into making sure that program three continued to operate, which program three actually provides a benefit to program four because it has a lot more existing production. So it's just a way of us focusing operations, amplifying revenue, which is obviously important for everyone, but at the same time, adding a lot of land value in the future. When oil's at 70 bucks and gas is at $2, you're lucky to get one, a one X multiple on land. When the numbers are higher, $90 oil, $5 gas, you're looking at three X. So it really wasn't much of a bailout. It was more of a time frame. We were just saying we could sell the properties and break even or lose a little bit, but as good stewards running a fund as a program sponsor, I don't think a good steward packs it up and quits. I think they find a way to make things work for the investors. Thanks. That helps clarify. Okay. So thanks. 
So next, how do you mitigate uh, the risk of a dry well? Also, can you share the history of your drilling activities? Percentage of dry walls out of the total drill wells. Sure, yeah. Mitigating the risk of a dry well comes from expansion of land. So while most oil and gas deals that you'll have come across your way, you're looking at people that are have two to 3,000 acres and they're trying to drill three to five wells. So if you drill one dry hole, which does happen, you're going to lose 30 to 40% of the potential value in the fund. We're a portfolio builder and we use a lot of modern technology. We even have technology that after we drill, we send a robotic down the hole to, to detect where the hydrocarbons are to be more efficient. If we're drilling, and this has this recently happened in November of last year, we were about $600,000 into a well that we were drilling. The mud logs and all the information we got from the rock was basically telling us this is going to be a dry hole. So we pulled out and we saved the remaining million and a half and applied it towards a new well. So the way that we mitigate the risk of a dry well, number one is good geology, good engineering always mitigates that risk. But it's also making sure that you're monitoring your performance as you go. Uh, there are going to be dry holes. That, that is just part of oil and gas. But our percentage over time, this is a 26-year-old company, so I don't have the whole history. But our percentage of truly dry holes is extremely low. Somewhere in the 4 to 6% range is what I would estimate. But don't quote me on that. But it's fairly low. Modern technology and modern seismic technology in particular really mitigates that risk. Okay. So what's your IR? Do you ever calculate in terms of IR? Oh, of course. I come from the Wall Street world, so everything's an IR to me. This industry is difficult with the tax advantages, the volatility of oil and gas prices and monthly income and the exit. We avoid doing a comprehensive IR because it would make us essentially sound ridiculous. When you add in a 100% tax benefit to even a 10% annual yield plus a three and a half X multiple, the IR is pretty hard. So we focus our IR studies really more on the monthly passive income which we calculate that to be anywhere between over the course of a five-year period, 14 and 21%. If you add in the taxes and the exit, which are both taxes, we can say with certainty, you're going to get your tax benefit. With some certainty, you're going to get income. We just don't know where it'll be in the beginning and in the end. And the exit is dependent upon how developed the land is, who the buyers are and market conditions. So in a traditional venture capital deal, where I'm investing $10 million into a company looking to get $30 million out in a couple of years, IR is a lot easier to calculate that way than it is with a tax benefit, monthly income, and a multiple. But our IR, we focus in on the rate of return on the income, which we project to be anywhere between 14 and 21% year over year. Okay. Okay. So this next question talks about the tax benefits. So aren't the tax benefits better? if the investors come in as GP. And I remember when I, we did the fund, our fund, we actually came as GP first year, and then there was like a switch to an LP, right? Yes. Okay, so can you please explain that? Yeah, so in our tax benefit in oil and gas, we get write-offs for tangible and intangible drilling costs. So all the money we spend, if we spend it in the appropriate way, number one, it helps that the more money we have on hand, the longer out we can plan and avoid supply chain and inflation issues. But more importantly, the way that we spend our capital, the IRS code allows us to write off both tangible and intangible drilling costs. So below the surface and above the surface. Every one of those is attributed to the entire fund. But as a GP, you get the ability to write off a bulk of it in year one. As an LP, it would be 100% write off 20% a year for five years. Now, in real estate, that's a tricky thing because you're used to having GP liability. In oil and gas, the way that every, especially Texas oil and gas companies are structured, we're all required to have a $20 million umbrella policy to cover liability. But the way that oil and gas is done, King, we don't have a drill rig behind us in a storage facility. We rent them, we lease them, and we contract. So for each phase of a drilling component, every phase from those preparing the surface, drilling the hole, doing completions, fracking, those are all independent contractors that we're managing. Each one of them per our contracts is required to have a $20 million umbrella policy as well. So the liability to a GP in oil and gas is significantly reduced down to next to nothing. You can, of course, always get an outside insurance policy to cover anything else. But the way it works with us is your GP to come in, so you get a big year one write-off. And as the last penny of the fund is deployed, so when the 
when dollar number 200 million is deployed in the field, the following January 1st, every GP with the exception of King is automatically converted to an LP for the duration of the fund. Okay. So there's a question about minimum investment. Yes, our minimum investment is 100,000 into the fund. Okay. So if you have anything slightly below, contact us to, to know if there's space, but otherwise it's under care. Yes, and for accredited investors only. I want to make sure we, we have to have an accreditation letter on file. Yes, and we can tell you where to find how to get accreditation accreditation letter. You can get it from your accountants or there are some third parties online. You can upload your information and then you get your letter. Yes. I get mine every year. How much has the management invested in the fund? Good question. Yeah, we're heavily invested here. It's from the management down, <laughs> which extends down into the senior vice presidents. We have, I don't know the exact number, but it's anywhere between 2.5, or excuse me, 5.2 and 5.5 million invested internally. Okay. And I am one of those investors. I, I invest, I don't like, I will tell you this. I've been an entrepreneur for years running my own companies. And in, in 2022, I haven't filed my taxes till October. But my CPA told me I'm getting a tax return. I haven't heard. I didn't know that word still existed. It's been 17 years since I've had a tax return. And I'm only getting that because I am a W-2 and I invested in oil and gas. So we certainly invest on our own to manage our own taxes and for the overall return. If I invest today, within how many months may I expect monthly payments to start? And how late in the calendar year can an investor come in? Good questions. It's easier to answer this question now than it was six months ago because we hadn't had revenue yet, but revenue just began this month for the fund, for the newest version of the fund, the last program coming in, that's now being completely distributed across all shareholders. In our business, everything is a net 60. So when we sell oil, generally we get paid 30 days later on a net 30 and the money file funnels through the company. And then 30 days after that, we distribute. So 60 days after your investment, you'll start receiving monthly passive, passive distributions. And you can invest until 1159 on December 31st of this year. And what we see a lot of times is we find folks that are they come in for $100,000 in April. And they get closer to tax season when they're doing tax planning. And generally, we raise about 30 to 40% of our money in the month of December when people realize they need tax write-offs. So all the way up until as long as you have a date stamp on the check, a wire, or even a package being sent from the post office previous to the next year, all the way up to the last minute, it does still count for your tax purposes. Okay. So let's go again. So the profits are taxable after a period, right? The profits are, so the way it works is until the fund shows a profit on paper, which will take five to six years with this type of capital raise, with the expenses that we incur in oil and gas, there are no tax disadvantages. The gains, so if we're looking at it from, I put in 200,000 and hypothetically, I got 700,000 on a three and a half X, right? What we're shooting for. If that happened, the way it would work is your $200,000, once it's returned to you, would have what's called a recapture. So the taxes you avoided would be taxed. So your ordinary income on AGI would kick in. The rest of it would be a long-term capital gain. But here's the beauty, and this is how wealthy people use oil and gas. There's a reason why they made a TV show called Dallas in the state of Texas about the oil industry with really rich people. So in oil and gas, let's just look at that scenario. If we invested 200,000 and we got 700,000 at the end, we'd have a 200,000 recapture burden on taxes. And then we'd have $500,000 in capital gains. What happens at King is we are a continual fund model. So we, as soon as this fund closes, we'll find new properties and open up a new fund. You can actually do a 1031 exchange in oil and gas, from oil and gas to oil and gas, from oil and gas to real estate, and actually from real estate to oil and gas. So what you do is 1031, yeah. whatever amount you're looking for, avoid the taxes and the recapture, but more importantly, in oil and gas, you're in, say you did the whole seven hundred thousand, you'd be able to reduce your income by another seven hundred thousand while avoiding taxation on what you've already profited from. So yes, it is taxable upon the exit. Part of it is a recapture; the rest is long-term capital gains. But talk to your accountant, not me. I'm not an accountant, not giving tax advice. I'm just an officer of a company. 
that's actually the next one. So someone asked if you have a CPA that you personally recommend, like maybe your own CPA. <laughs> yeah, I work with Pine & Co. So the guy's name is Mike Pine. He is my CPA. Mike is a fantastic person. And he is, more importantly, completely schooled on oil and gas. Well, we know uh, he actually sends us, Mike? Yeah, we brought him on in February to give the group a talk, so. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah, Mike is great. Like he's, he is my CPA. He gave me the good news that I don't have to pay taxes last year. So I like Mike a lot, even, even more now. But I was actually on his podcast a month ago and a bunch of other stuff. But Mike Pine is who I would personally recommend. If you don't, if your CPA isn't familiar with oil and gas, that's another service we provide to investors. As you get towards tax time, if you don't want to look for a new CPA, all you'd have to do is put your CPA in touch with Rex Gifford. And he will walk him through exactly how to file the returns and use the K-1s properly. While I would advise you to talk to Mike Pine and see if you like working with him, I like him. If you didn't want to go that route, our firm will work with your CPA directly to help them understand. Yeah, I would say you need to have business and very high income. Yes. <laughs> to use Mike Pine. It's expensive. <laughs> uh, you get what you so, pay for in taxes, man. That's the one thing that's for sure. True. I'll get my way up there soon. So uh, another one, aren't there some restriction on what percentage of your assets are in oil? No, not as not, there may be, but not as far as I know. The restrictions on oil and gas are the amount of write-offs you can get. So a W-2 employee can only actually defer, I think it's 555000 depending on which tax code you're using. So anywhere between 540 and 550, a little over 500000 is the maximum deduction that you can take. But there are plenty of people. I talked to a guy six weeks ago who has all $48 million of his net worth invested in oil and gas. So th there's no restriction on what you can contribute into or invest in, but there are definitely restrictions on the amount of write-offs you can have. Yeah. I learned about the limit, the hard way <laughs> <laughs> this year, last year. So I was expecting to pay zero tax, but let's just say <laughs> once you, as long as your W-2 income, there's a limit to it. Stay educated and also communicate with your CPA. <laughs> yes, Ahead plan your taxes. Make sure you yeah. plan them throughout the year. It's still good, but it could be better. Absolutely. So someone said, tell me again, <laughs> like a fifth grader, why are there dry when technology already shows where all the oil is? Sure, That's a, 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 this is exactly how I tell my fifth grader at home. You can have all the technology in the world that tells you there's oil right there, but it doesn't mean that God will give you the ability to drill through the rock and get it. So there, there's the planning strategy, like Mike, one of Mike Tyson's famous quotes, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Sometimes the rock below the surface is too difficult to drill, and it'll cost you too much or simply grind out your drill bit, and you can't get to the oil. We know where the oil is, but it doesn't mean you can actually get all of it out of the ground. That's actually the way that you prove up properties is to show that the land will yield. The land itself, we can have all the technology in the world, but if God creates a terrain that our technology can't get through effectively, we could have a dry hole. All right, I'm going to jump in and take over bird dogging these questions. So next one, is there debt associated with 200K investment? So we did acquire 18 million in debt from the merger. There is no plan for new debt right now. The interest rates are way too high. So on a $280 million combined raise, we have $18 million in debt, very low debt exposure. We're already paying that down. We would actually prefer and probably will raise more capital at the end instead of going to the debt market because I hate to say it, but I've been right for six months about what the Fed is doing. Everyone keeps saying they're, gonna they're not going to pause. Rates are going to continue to go up. They've stated it. It's time for us to listen to them instead of being Pollyanna. We have no intentions of taking on any additional debt until the debt markets are open unfrozen and rates are at a good place. There's a ton of cash in the marketplace. I would rather get an investment from an investor than take a loan from a bank. So there is a small amount of exposure to debt from fund three, but at the same time, we are very much focused on actually making sure that we have equity available instead of debt. I think you touched on this next question, but if there's anything to add, what are additional risks with the investment? What are ways it can go wrong? Uh, one of them that we're talking about in the space right now is crazy lunatics in the government trying to shut down the world like COVID for climate change. So that's actually, it sounds stupid to even say out of my mouth, but these are actually things being talked about in the market, is that they're thinking about doing global lockdowns for climate change. That certainly would affect us. 
Other natural disasters are certainly could impact our operations. The average drill rig can withstand about 150 mile an hour winds. They're very large structures. Pricing is always a risk. We can't control pricing. We can only control our productivity. So while we try to increase production, we can't control the cost of drilling, what we have to rent to be able to get these things done. And we certainly can't control the prices in the open market. Those are the two most significant risks in oil and gas. Everything else is, a, there's a risk in the risk. It's ridiculous even saying that a government or governments around the world are considering locking people down to change the climate. It's time for this lunacy to end, but that certainly isn't, that's a new risk to me. That's one that I've heard recently, but it's generally just natural disasters, economic conditions, the cost of drilling, and the price of the commodity. Got it. And then the next two questions are the same. Has King ever had any SEC complaints? Are you even registered with the SEC? We are registered with the SEC. So we're a Reg D filing. We're completely registered. I don't believe, I haven't been here the whole 26 years, but as far as I know, we have no SEC complaints. That is, I'm pretty sure I would know if that was the case, but I'm pretty certain we do not over a 26 year period. And I have a feeling that probably stems from just some recent oil and gas. Oh yeah, I know who you're talking about. Let's call it All right, go ahead. You can take it from there. Yeah, no, we're not a Ponzi scheme in any way. You can absolutely verify every we've ever drilled on the Railroad Commission. Uh, Everyone should be on their toes. Ponzi schemes affect industries, not just their business. So we've dealt with, I know the exact operation you're talking about. We've had, we, we've been accused of it before because we've had some difficult months of low production, but you can see our wells. We do videos from our wells pretty consistently when we visit them. A lot of our investors will put, a, put together 10 or 12 people and take you to our operations. We are an absolute legitimate organization filed with the SEC. And as far as I know, we don't have any complaints, but we're certainly not a Ponzi scheme. That, that made my stomach turn when I heard it because a friend of mine invested in it. Instead of investing with us about six weeks before that happened, and we know a lot of the people who've been you know, taken for a ride in that scenario. That's certainly not us. Damn, I've had a lot of friends invested in that. Bio, I think, has some connections that have actually flown to some of your wells, right? Is that correct? Yes. I've been self. Uh, yeah. My mentor, I've been there, and I trust him with my... <laughs> I trust him very well. And also, Jasmine is not here, but another fellow physician in all our physician investment group. He's, he's been there. Even He went with his family, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a lot of pictures with his kids. So yeah. they are like holding different oil rig things. <laughs> so yeah. You know, yeah, they were like touching it and stuff. So unless, you know, it, it has to be such an elaborate scheme to be able yeah. to make all these things up. Yeah, I went with Goroff the last time to the well. So we were stuck on this little tiny plane flying out into a county with 1,200 people in it. But next time you ask Goroff, we stopped at this little place outside of one of our drilling operations, had the best onion rings I've ever had in my life. I love Goroff. He's one of my favorite people. You might be coming to the Dallas one, right? You have one in Dallas? Not in Dallas. There's no, really no rigs in Dallas, but we have an operation in Tyler. It's two hours away. I have, I've only been to Borden County myself. I'm generally busy in the office, but we do excursions out to the wells when investors want to go. They're generally in the middle of nothing. That's, uh, that's uh, the, when I say nothing, they're in the middle of nothing. Borden County, Texas literally has 1,200 people in the entire county. So getting out there is a challenge, but our teams, even when we have an operation, we actually build a city. So the roughnecks and the engineers, they actually live on site while we're drilling. They live in trailers. So that's how desolate these operations are. There aren't even hotels nearby, but yeah, we're happy to take anyone there. We have folks from the office that go out for checkups all the time. And we always ask them to do a video just so we can share it with people and they can see the operations. All right, next question. Do you do horizontal or vertical or both? And I think you touched on that in the talk. Yeah, yeah we do both. There, it depends on the rock. Everything depends on the rock. If we see a pocket that we can hit with a vertical cheaply, we certainly will. Horizontals have a much higher rate of production and hitting. So we certainly mix them up in both scenarios. Horizontal and vertical, we just depends on the terrain and where we are. The program, excuse me, the Borden County program has five wells, two horizontal and three vertical, just as an example. And can you use a self-directed IRA or I'll add solo 401k to invest in these assets? Yes, on the solo 401k, as long as they're self-directed, which most solo 401ks are. But yeah, we take qualified funds as well. 
I wanted to jump back to the question about leasing and selling the lease because I'm in mineral rights. I mentioned that to you before, Eric. And the way I understood that is the mineral rights owners own the land. So how does that kind of coincide with what you described where the mineral rights gets the first? They're um, usually separate. So there's a surface owner. So you have, so if I'm a ranch owner, I own the surface and the minerals. So what ranch owners will do a lot of times is they'll own the surface, but they'll lease out the minerals below the surface. Got it. So as a mineral rights owner, you own the minerals below the surface that get pulled out. In our lease exchanges, when we do a sale, the way it works is a new operator, a new driller will come in and say, I want to buy the lease from you and the production, everything that we've created, they'll buy it all. But when they do that, they're generally two separate people. So there's the surface rights and the mineral rights. They're generally separate. In Borden County, they're the same. It's the same Miller family that owns them all. That makes sense. Yep. And then question about the future, maybe longer term, longer, let's go out 10, 15 years. Where does oil and gas kind of look with all this ESG movement, the, the attempt to move to electric and alternate sources? Yeah. I just did a podcast on this morning, so I'll pull out my news, my, my show sheet here. Here's some stats that I think everyone should know. This was just done by the Manhattan Institute. 84% of the world's energy comes from coal, oil, and gas. Over the past 20 years, $5 trillion in government money, $5 trillion in private money have gone into green energy, which has reduced dependency on fossil fuels by 2%. 97% of the world's transportation occurs through fossil fuels, specifically oil, 97% even with electric cars. If we plan to go to electric cars, number one, there's not enough cobalt or lithium on planet earth to replace every car on the road. It does, it's not godly possible. He did not make enough materials. If we were to go to wind and solar as a major player in the space, which it's proven it can't be, we would have to increase our mining needs to go green by a thousand percent, 1000 percent. So at the end of the day, we're gonna to have to use more diesel, more, fuel, more coal, more iron, build more machinery, which all takes natural gas, petroleum, and coal, and most of the rare earth materials we need for green energies come from China. So the chances of us going to a fully green planet are truly a myth. They're not logical. They don't make sense. To build an electric car battery, you need 800 barrels of oil to build the battery. You have to move 250,000 tons of dirt to get enough cobalt and lithium. 250,000 tons of dirt. That requires diesel. We look at energy demand. People are saying the demand for oil and gas is dropping. How is that possible? The energy needs have only increased with humanity. Ever since we invented the first machine, we've required more energy. We don't run on whale blubber lamps anymore. We run on smartphones. These things require 12 to 13 years of full carbon emission from the phone just to make it to get the materials. Most of our world has forgotten supply chain. You know, most people think a hamburger is a hamburger. They don't realize you have to actually grow a cow, kill it, process it, package it, ship it, buy it, then eat it. In the middle of this, you can look at all the demands that exist. So 80% of the world's air travel, 80% is for personal use. Our air travel right now today requires 2 billion barrels of oil per year. Hospitals use 250 times more energy than a standard commercial building. We are building one hospital for every two commercial buildings in 2023 because people are getting sick. The cloud, just to operate the cloud, requires two times the entire energy usage of the nation of Japan, two times the third largest economy in the world of energy just to operate the cloud. So if we just forget about the fact that we're building more planes, trains, automobiles, and boats, buildings and hospitals, we're entering into a period of AI, uh, quantum computing, cloud computing, and more device, more technology requiring more energy over time. It's not a logical proposition that green energy gives the world. What you're watching is a new religion that's creating crazy people that are void of logic. And I don't care who is offended by saying that because I will just speak the truth. Green energy, we need it because we need energy. Period. We need wind, we need solar, but it's never going to replace petroleum, ever. It's not mathematically possible. What's happening right now is you're seeing the world going, we need more oil. We don't need less, we need more. If we plan on making green energies, we need more oil. So I think the outlook for oil and gas in the next five to 10 years, I don't have a crystal ball, although up here is not too bad from time to time. I think we're going to see near $100 a barrel oil by the end of the year. I think that'll extend. 
I think we're looking at war. Obviously, there's a war in Ukraine and Russia, which is spreading into Belarus and all the Baltics. The Baltics actually just separated from the Russian grid today. You're looking at warfare in Niger. You're looking at economic warfare between France and Niger. Africa is, a, is right now erupting in coups and civil wars. We're not going into a peaceful period where people just want to relax on a beach with wind and solar energy coming from their smartphone. We're entering into a period where nations are mounting up against nations, and that requires energy and machinery. We are also looking at economic positions like we've never seen before when it comes to demands for computing power. People don't realize that most of the Bitcoin mines in the world, server farms, they run on natural gas power. And not to mention the fact if you build electric vehicles for everyone in the world, which isn't mathematically possible, what do you have to do to charge them? You have to plug them into a wall that uses the energy grid. Interesting fact is they actually just found a new superconducting metal in Africa, which is why you're starting to see wars, because for most of its existence, that's where most of the resources are. And these countries are tired of having northern and western countries raid their land and steal their wealth. We're watching the world change probably for the better. It'll be tough for a while. But I think we're starting to see sovereignty with BRICS mounting and all these nations going against the U.S. dollar. You guys should watch my podcast, The Rice Report. I go through all these things in a 30-minute 30, 30 period. But my outlook on oil and gas is so good, I decided to work in it. I come from technology. I come from quantum biology. But my last business, we figured out how to use quantum physics to enhance the properties and performance of biological entities. A little different than oil and gas. I'm in this business because I see its potential over the next five to 10 years, and I want to be part of it. And that was an awesome answer. <laughs> you definitely hit his, you hit his soft <laughs> points, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> so this again, for all those stats, or just I'm going to get on your podcast because I'm in the same line of thinking as you as well. So Happy to have you. And we'll send you out a link tomorrow when it's published. I just filmed about two hours, three hours ago. Yes. We need to end, though. I was starting to get a dry mouth from all the questions. So. <laughs> I see one from Damu. Does the fund have any admin fees? No, we're not a, a two and 20 fund. We're a project fund. Is the management compensated for profits completely? Management? No. The company, we take 80% or excuse me, we take 20% of the monthly net profits as a company. But other than that, there's no future compensation and everything is literally line item for you every month in our statements. Sorry about that, Damu, I missed that. And then there was another one after that. Investors will be LPs, right? In yes, in the end. Yeah. Okay. And my podcast is called The Rice Report. That's what it's called. Can you type it in the... Oh, sure. In the chat. It's on YouTube. Link. Okay. And then we we'll send an email out also. And... Just launched it. So it's only on the second episode, but I've been doing this for two and a half years on Telegram. So I, I actually shut that down when I started working here because I talk about things that most companies don't want you to talk about. I talk about the three things in my own personal, the Rice Report is financial, but my own personal podcast, I talk about politics, religion, and money, and they all work hand in hand. I am a believer. I don't hide that fact from anything. And I think you should be because eternity is much better than the earth we live in. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Eric. And uh, thanks, George. Thanks, everyone, for coming. You have a great show. And uh, if you want to reach out, reach out to me, and I can tell you about my experience. And then i link you with one, either Brad or Eric. Uh, if you want to reach out to them also, you can. Reach out either. to Brad. I'm much busier than Brad. Reach out <laughs> to Brad, for sure. Go <laughs> <laughs> so to the vibes. Okay, that's about it. Because we believe everybody has something to do, put the kids to bed and everything. We're going to end here and then we're going to share the recording once everybody is happy with it. Eric, Brad, and our team is happy with the recording. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank Take you, care. everybody. God bless you. Thank you. Bye.